Hello everybody. Welcome to World Oceans Day and this presentation about yellow submarines for greener science. My name is Christian Thaler and I am the program manager for Oceanids, which is a program developing equipment that is run by the National Oceanography Centre for UK scientists. You might be wondering why I am speaking to you today rather than one of our engineers. And part of the reason is that I'm hoping to show you that wherever your skills lie, there are different routes into the world of ocean science. I started out by studying physics and went on to do a PhD at the University of Southampton in laser refrigeration, which used laser beams not to heat things up, but to cool them down. I went on to become an engineer in a startup company where we were developing a new medical device for dental applications because, and here is a scary statistic, using current techniques, there is a 20% chance that your dentist will remove the wrong tooth if you get toothache. Not that I want to scare you. So, so far, so good. But after only a year, that startup company went bust and I was left unemployed which was when I found that prospective employers seemed to prefer candidates who had what you might call real world work experience, rather than having spent three years of their life studying for a postgraduate qualification, even though that is essential if you are planning on having an academic career. And I think if I could go back to the younger me, I would definitely tell myself that it is very important to take opportunities for work experience, even where that is alongside continued academic study. So struggling to find a job in engineering, I eventually found a position as a project manager back at the university, but that meant I felt, found myself stuck outside my intended scientific career path. And this was all a bit of a disappointment. But quite quickly, I began to realize just how lucky I had actually been. Because, and here I will make a confession, I really only studied physics because I wanted people to think I was clever. Which worked, by the way. And if I'm honest, I wasn't much good at it, and I wouldn't have gone very far in my career. But what I did turn out to be pretty good at was project management organizing activity and influencing people to enable teams to deliver specific outcomes. And when events pushed me once again to seek a new job, I had the good fortune to get my present role here at NOC and apply my combination of management and technology skills to oceanography, where I could make a real difference to the world we live in. So what has my experience taught me? I think the most important lesson is to find the right path for you, whether that's in terms of your learning. And it's probably worth saying that since I have been here at NOC, I have also done an apprenticeship in management, and that has been one of the most valuable learning journeys of my life. Or whether it's in your choice of career. Becoming a scientist or an engineer can be an extremely rewarding experience. But NOC is a very diverse organisation in terms of the opportunities it offers. And whether we're scientists, engineers, sailors, managers, or other corporate support staff, we are all contributing to our understanding of the world's oceans. The main thing is to find something that you enjoy and that inspires you. And if you find yourself trapped in a career that actually you are not enjoying, you know, don't be afraid to change direction. But that's enough about me. So let's dive in to what it is I actually do. Currently, NOC has two research ships, the James Cook and the Discovery. And scientists go out on these to undertake their research. There is also another ship, the Sir David Attenborough, run by the British Antarctic Survey, which is also able to support UK scientists doing science in polar regions. 
It's all hands on deck when these research expeditions go out. And it's certainly not a holiday cruise. There are bits of equipment to winch in and out, water samples to take, portable laboratories to do experiments in, and much more besides. However, displacing more than 5,000 tonnes, these ships produce a lot of carbon emissions. And that means that while we are doing research to study the impact of climate change, we are also doing a fair bit to contribute to it. So the Oceanids programme is working on the problem of how to deliver the same research in a more environmentally friendly way, ideally with net zero emissions, what we call the future net zero oceanographic capability. There are different strands to this, including clean energy for future ship design and how to use data in more efficient ways. But the bit that Oceanids is focused on is something called marine autonomy. So what is marine autonomy? Autonomy is not just one type of vehicle. You can see on the right that we operate lots of different types of autonomous platforms at NOC, and not all of them are yellow, nor are they all submarines or autonomous underwater vehicles as we know them. Several are autonomous surface vehicles, which means that we can do different types of science with them. Here on the left, we have the vehicle you are probably most familiar with, Boating McBoatface or Autosub Long Range, as the platform is called. And on the right, we have a Sea Worker 4, which is a commercial platform that we also use. But what do I mean when I say a vehicle is smart or autonomous? The answer to that is that it is uncrewed, so there are no people on board which is a good job because they are quite small and most of the vehicle is not watertight, so it wouldn't be a very fun experience. But not only is there no one on board, unlike remotely piloted vehicles where there is someone transmitting instructions, autonomous vehicles pilot themselves. You can give the vehicle some mission parameters in advance, perhaps the end destination or a certain search pattern or a certain variable that you want it to look for in the ocean. And then a vehicle like Boaty will go off and do the journey on its own. And if that autonomy is also controlling sensors like cameras, thermometers or other special devices to measure nutrients or other ocean parameters, then the vehicle can study everything from how much carbon the sea is absorbing to the health of fish or ocean plastics. When I talk about a smart or autonomous vehicle, these can be submarines or they can be surface vessels. And though you can make large ships smart, in Norway they already have ferries without crews, the ones that we use are relatively small and light. This means that they use less energy to get around and it allows us to power them in cleaner ways. Underwater vehicles use batteries that can be recharged using electricity generated from renewable energy sources. And some, called gliders, even have wings so that they can fly long distances underwater just by using their weight what we call buoyancy in the marine environment. That means they don't have to use propellers, which use a lot of energy. Surface vehicles offer other clean energy options. They can have solar panels on them to generate their own electricity. And one type called wave glider has a special device that turns up and down energy from waves into forward motion. But that is not the only reason for using autonomous vehicles. So why else might we want to use autonomous vehicles? 
The answer, as you may guess from the title, is that they can go to places either where people can't get to or where it would be extremely dangerous for them to go. This can include going very deep, and both Boti and our larger auto sub can go down to 6,000 meters, where the pressure is 600 times higher than standing on dry land. Or to put it another way, it would be like me piling up 500 double-decker buses on top of you. So our vehicles really have to operate in very harsh conditions. Another area where autonomy is very valuable is underneath ice shelves at the poles. They can stay there without needing air for a crew to breathe. And these are areas that are affected by climate change and where as scientists, we really want to understand how quickly the ice is melting, what that means for the rise in sea levels and how it will affect the ecosystems in those areas. However, when you want to study the sea close up to the ice, then you risk hitting icebergs or getting trapped. So we really don't want people to be down there. And autonomy lets you get to these places safely and for longer than a crewed mission um, could go. But while the use of autonomous vehicles for science is an important part of NOx mission, the focus of Oceanids is on developing new vehicles. So I'm just going to say a little bit about what our engineers do in terms of development, because these are projects that require people with lots of different specialist skills to bring them together to make new ideas a reality for scientists. So from the outside, Boti here may look quite simple, but open him up and his insides are full of complicated technology. This is a time-lapse video of Autosub 2000 Under Ice, our larger vehicle, before it went to Loch Ness for testing. We need to have specialist mechanical engineers who ensure that the vehicle can hold its shape under extreme pressures, which includes designing extremely heavy and strong titanium vessels to keep all the electronics dry. The mechanical engineers also have to ensure that the buoyancy is correct so that the vehicle doesn't sink, but also to make sure it's not so light that it just bobs around on the surface. And that's a very delicate balance to get right. They are supported by specialist electronics engineers who make sure that the complicated wiring, batteries, and other circuitry uh, is all designed, working, and integrated into the vehicle. They also work with the uh, batteries to make sure that it can power itself. Then there are engineers who deal with the onboard software, so the actual autonomy element, the brains of the vehicle, if you like. This is particularly challenging in under ice environments where the vehicle can't just surface to get a GPS fix and compasses won't work accurately because it's close to the magnetic pole. So our engineers have to work out other innovative ways of navigating in these domains. 
There are other engineers who deal with the web software that allows us to talk to the vehicles from shore and get data back. The vehicles themselves can be out in the middle of the ocean, but we can get that science data when we're just sitting in our offices in Southampton or in other research institutions around the UK. And so that allows us to interpret the data while the vehicle is on site and give the vehicle new parameters for its autonomous mission. For example, telling it that this is somewhere interesting that we want to explore further. Then there are systems engineers who take all these different bits and integrate them to make sure that the whole vehicle works as one, because it's no good having a collection of parts that don't work together. So there are all sorts of fascinating aspects to marine engineering that provide different routes into supporting ocean science, depending on where your skills and interests lie. In this picture, we have a photo of Autosub 2000 under ice, also testing in Loch Ness just last week. It's a much bigger vehicle than Boaty, and it can't stay underwater for as long, just one week compared to Boaty's three months. But it can operate heavier, higher power sensors, such as sonars for underwater mapping, and other sensors for monitoring marine biology. And did we spot Nessie's eyes during that trial? I just don't know. But while that search will have to go on another day, we have encountered intelligent life during our Autosub trials. And here is a short clip from a trial where we were testing new equipment for Boaty. We didn't know that there were any dolphins in the area. But one came up to Boaty and we think just wanted to play. So we turned off the propeller to make sure that it couldn't get injured and let them get along. Clearly, it's not just our engineers and scientists who think that yellow submarines are fun, safe and a greener way to explore the world's ocean and tackle what are probably the most important challenges facing the world today. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for that um, very interesting presentation. I think what we do now is we move on to our main Q&A session. Um, and before we get into the main uh, crux of the presentation, our questions around the, uh, the, the presentation, just a, uh, a quick warm up question, really. Um, and I'm asking all of our presenters this. What is your favorite ocean and why? So my favourite ocean has to be, I think, the Atlantic Ocean, um, and for no other reason that it's, than it's um, near where I grew up. I grew up in Plymouth um, on the south coast, and so I've always considered it my home ocean, and it's where a lot of you know, our exploration began, you know, from our country. It was the, uh, the final frontier for many years, so yes, definitely the Atlantic. Yeah. Right. Another easy one. Um, why are our vehicles yellow? So our vehicles are yellow because we, and, and to be fair, they're not all yellow. Uh, we do have one pink one and certainly other organisations have other colours, often orange, and there's the odd green one. Uh, but it, it's so that you can see them in rough seas. So we're recovering these vehicles where either there are very large waves in, in poor conditions or also where there's a lot of ice around and so the vehicle is not very well exposed and so you have to be able to try to spot the vehicle. It does have a strobe light on it and a radio transmitter 
but getting that visual fix for the recovery onto the ships is very important. Thank you. Just, just uh, touching on the, the research which you've, you're, you've just recently undertaken, um, read about it on the, on the BBC website, um, but the research you undertook at uh, Loch Ness, um, what were you hoping to achieve there? So at Loch Ness, we went there with two vehicles this time. One is Boaty, that's an Autosub Long Range, and the other one is our larger Autosub 2000. And these are at different stages of development. So Boaty is a very well-developed platform in terms of its hydrodynamics, its general mechanical engineering is well proven. And, and so for that, we were testing new navigation software and obstacle avoidance um, systems that are designed to help it run under ice. Whereas for Autosub 2000, that, is, that was its first in water trials. So we have to do much more basic yeah, cameras off. engineering cameras off. Is it? Uh, testing so. there. Um, so yes, your camera is off. But so we were, we were doing more basic engineering of all the control surfaces. It has a, a new cross-form rudder, which is requires a lot more uh, computer processing to use effectively, uh, but is also um, more reliable. So that, so that was the different stage of uh, development. And the reason that we're putting them both through the Loch Ness trials is that we want to make sure the vehicles are completely reliable before we go off and do the science missions to make sure that the scientists who have waited years often you know, to get these missions programmed do get the data they need and that we get this very expensive equipment back to use again for future science. Great. And within the presentation, obviously, one of the, the major objectives is to reach net zero uh, of the oceans program. Um, but do you see research ships continue to play a role in oceanography in a, as we kind of trans, transcend to a um, net zero world? So we are undertaking a scoping study as well at the moment, um, led by NOC with other partners. And that's exploring not just autonomy, but different types of technology and how that will contribute to net zero. So one of the things to look at are sensor systems, uh, the impact of science need and policy on what we're doing, data ecosystems as well, and ship technologies. And I'm not sure what the conclusion of that report will be at the moment, but I personally think that there will remain a role for something that looks a bit like a research ship because these are able to do things like seismic surveys that you can't do with smaller autonomous platforms. But what that ship is will probably look very different to what we consider you know, today's research ships to be. Um, they'll be including things like uh, cleaner fuels, cleaner energy and propulsion, but also potentially a large degree of automation in the ship to reduce the crew and allow it to go out for longer periods on, it, on its own, maybe with no crew. And it's also likely to act as a hub for autonomy in a connected world. So lots of different types of um, autonomous platforms like ALR and Dr. Sub 2000 will all be linked through that research ship. So probably we will have a research ship, but it might have changed um, what it looks like. Mm, okay. So uh, another question has just come in. Um, the auto subs, uh, specifically on the auto subs, actually, um, are they in operation today? Are they out there? Doing so work? the auto auto sub um, long range. Uh, there are so there are six of those. So Boaty is one of them, and they some of them go to six thousand meters. So for deep science, that's three of them. And the other three only go down to 1,500 metres, but they can stay underwater for a lot longer. Um, and, and so that enables us to do different types of science in different domains. And so we have those six. We have a large vehicle, Autosub 6000, um, which goes for shorter missions, but can do things like sonar scans and camera surveys of the seabed. And then we have Autosub 2000 coming online, which is 
basically the next generation of that Auto Sub 6000 uh, work. And we are regularly putting these out on ships throughout the year uh, doing surveys. And then almost uh, continually, we have these uh, gliders, uh, as we call them, which is another type of commercial um, vehicle that we, we buy. And so we, we run those and our autonomous surface vehicles pretty well non-stop getting science in different places. Okay. And, and what is the longest period of time that one of these subs can um, stay in the water for? So an ALR can be under there for three months now with the latest technologies. So when we started Oceanids, the auto sub long range was getting towards a month underwater. That was considered long. Um, now that we can do three months, but what we're really looking to do over the next uh, development cycle in the coming years is develop these persistent presence capabilities. And so a vehicle will go somewhere to do a study, then it will hibernate potentially on the seabed, wait for a season to pass, and then it will do another study. So you can monitor the same area of the same mission in different seasons. And, and then at the end of that, when perhaps ice shells have cleared again, you can get the vehicle back. So it will enable you to do some very, um, very advanced sites that we, we haven't been able to do yet, because currently you're, you're limited to going out and doing things in one continuous stretch. Mm. And obviously, you're at the very cutting edge of oceanography at the moment. Um, but what do you think the future holds for oceanography? Uh, I, I use the example of multiple submarines um, out there undertaking the research. So I, I think where we're going is this world of networked autonomy, where rather than having a couple of very large, very expensive, both from financial cost and carbon cost um, platforms, like research ships, you'll have lots of little autonomous vehicles that will go out and they can potentially cover a much wider area. They can potentially be out there continuously. So getting readings the whole time. And they will also, oh, yes, so, so that's the main thing. You can also guide the ship to, uh, to do the ship-based element in places of interest so that the ship doesn't waste time using up energy, trying to find the features underwater that he wants to study. So the um, so, so having that network of, of these platforms running together will be key to the future. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a, a question come in. Um, Two questions actually. Uh, the first one is, is hydrographic surveying an additional option for your auto subs? The hydrographical survey, um, so it, it depends. So if, if we're talking about mapping and, and undersea mapping, I don't know whether it's the right, I'm probably not the right person to say that it's the right thing to do with an auto sub. It's very high power missions that they that they take um and so certainly autonomous platforms can do it and then particularly I'd, I'd say for surface platforms it makes a lot of sense uh doing that whether you would use the auto sub specifically i i i'm a little more doubtful of but it could certainly take sensors that would allow you to do it in smaller areas and as we develop uh, vehicles that can stay under for increasing lengths of time, then you, you might you might get benefit, but I think you'd have to weigh up very carefully the the cost benefit of using an auto sub to do that. Mm, okay, yeah, possibly one we can take offline with with Paul later. But the second part of Paul's question is: uh, To what accuracy can you position your auto sub once it's in operation? So that really depends how far we've gone away from the base. So they have GPS on board. So the idea is that the vehicle, if it's in open water, it, it's doing its mission, it will surface, get a GPS fix, correct itself, and then continue. Once you start to get under the ice shelf, um, then obviously you lose that capability. 
So your reliance on understanding the currents and other other different um, means means of navigation. So we can we can usually be within you know a matter of Meet, meters out, ten, tens of meters out, um, typically where you want from where you want to be. And then of course, but the longer you go under ice, the bigger that the bigger that gap is is getting. Um, so it's a bit hard to quantify <laughs> quantify exactly. But some of the things that we have used um, developed recently under ocean is are terrain aid and navigation. So where you can't get satellite fixes using underwater maps to identify features under the sea so that you can triangulate where you are. So if you've got underwater ridges, you know, the vehicle can identify that with sonar and then use that to pinpoint its location and so correct for errors that are occurring. And also there's another system that we will be developing in the future um, called RAFOS. So that uses big uh, transmitters of sound sources underwater. So again, you, you put them out there for triangulation purposes. And if we deployed them along the edge of the ice shelf in Antarctica, and then you sent the uh, vehicle underneath, it should be able to hear the sound from those sources and, uh, and position itself more accurately and again, do those corrections. So we are gradually developing new ways to enhance that accuracy. Fantastic, thank you. I think we've probably got one uh, time for one last question. Um, and again, reverting back to your career and how you became involved in, in, in science and oceanography. Um, but if you could go back in time and, and give advice to a 15, 16 year old yourself, what would that one piece of advice be? So my, my advice to myself would be that I, I didn't do much in the way of work experience. I was very focused on my academic studies and to the, ex to the exclusion of real work. And I think I should have done more. And I think even in the modern world, uh, it's even more important actually than it was when I, um, when I was studying. So definitely get out there and alongside your studies, try to acquire that work experience because it will put you in really good stead when it comes to looking for a job and, just to understanding what it is you want to do and what you're good at. Good advice. And I think the advice I give myself is to go back and study harder to become an oceanographer because it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, so thank you. Just, just to wrap things up now. Thank you, Christian, for your, uh, your presentation and for uh, answering these, these questions. Um, to the audience, thank you very much for submitting the questions. Very interesting, uh, helping us to, to um, uh, provoke a debate, which, is, which has been very interesting. Um, these sessions are made available online, um, so you will be able to access, the, access them on demand after the session um, and for the next 30 days. But if you have any further questions uh, for Christian, Christian will be in the, in the speaker lounge, uh, which you can navigate to via the, um, the main page within the networks section of the, uh, of the website. So just leaves me to say thank you again to Christian. Thank you for joining um, and I will hope to see you soon.